Good afternoon. Welcome to the secret, sometimes secret history of Chelmsford Prison. My name's Lindsay Whitehouse. I worked at the prison for six years as Deputy Governor and I've always had interest in what went on. Now history can be a very dry old subject if it's all about dates and kings and queens and prime ministers. Hopefully you won't be saying that about this presentation. I will be talking about the prison building because it's important to know why it's here, who paid for it, who built it, what its background is. But the most important thing is to talk about the people. So I'm going to talk about the people who lived here. Now that's a polite way of saying prisoners who were sent to live here by the court. I'm also going to talk about the people who worked here. They had a bit more freedom of choice but we need to talk about the people who died here and that's quite a few in number. But as well as the people, the prison has an influence stretching way beyond normal expectations. So I'll tell you the story about a current British national treasure, somebody who you know very well, and how that person became a national treasure for events directly connected with the prison. The prison has also influenced international sports teams and one of the most famous football teams in the world owes a debt of gratitude to Chelmsford Prison. And finally, look at modern business. There's um, a long-standing local business with a worldwide reputation that again owes its existence directly to events started at Chelmsford Prison. I'll touch on links to the church, I'll touch on links to showbiz, and it wouldn't be tell about a prison if I didn't talk about an escape. Well, Chelmsford Prison isn't the first prison, the city which it is now, but the town it was originally has ever had. First prison was Mulsham Jail. So if you go from the current prison and just keep walking down Springfield Road to town, keep going till you hit Marks and Spencer. Turn left, walk for another 200 metres to the Stone Bridge, and the building to the right of that, Tony and Guy's hairdressers, is where the original Mulsham Jail was located. But it's near the river, it was often flooded, there was rodent infestations, the place was falling down, it was a health hazard, prisoners were dying there just because the conditions were so awful. So the justices of the peace decided that they really needed to build a new prison. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the justices of the peace because they're very important people. They still exist today, today they're just magistrates, but back then they were the landed gentry. They were the people that owned all the agricultural land, they owned the properties, they owned most of the businesses, and they were elected to be justice of the peace almost in a secret society. And the power they had was staggering. Um, they had the power to set the price rates for food locally, to set the rates of pay locally. They were responsible for the upkeep of roads, bridges, the workhouse and the prison, as well as magistrates administering the law. Uh, it was all men, no women. Um, and and they were the ones that were tasked with trying to identify uh, a site for the new prison. So they found a site, but after a little bit of review, there's a couple of reasons why they couldn't proceed. The new prison was designed and overseen by an architect, but most of the building work was done by the existing prisoners at Mulsham Jail, who were released daily. So they were let out of Mulsham Jail, they had to march up to the site, do all the building work and march back again. Um, so the site they originally identified is a bit too far away. And the other factor, the new prison needed to be near the courts. If it was a long way from the courts, when people were sentenced, if there was a long journey against dirt track roads to get to prison, it's very likely that criminal gangs would uh, attack the escorts and free their fellow criminals. So it, it really wasn't a good idea. That's proved to be good news for an existing family business because the original site was Sainsbury's at Bewley. That was what the original prison was going to be on. 
So the search continued and the justices of the peace were sitting round drinking port, having a chat after dinner and a member of the Mildmay family, who are very prominent in Chelmsford, uh, identified that they had a property that might be ideal for the new prison and that's the site that the prison's on now. That property was bought by the justices at a very handsome profit for the Mildmay family. They certainly weren't giving anything away. But there was a little bit of a problem because the whole site was an existing farm and there was a family of tenant farmers on it. The Mildmay family sold it, made a lot of money. They did stipulate that there should be some compensation to the family that was being evicted just to pay for the loss of one year's crop. When you consider they lost their house, they lost their livelihood, they lost their whole family residence, I don't think compensation of loss of one year's crop was a great deal. But the family couldn't do anything about it. The site was sold. Building started in 1822. First brick was turned in 1822. It was convict labour, so it was six years until it was completed. But eventually it was completed. Um, the final sign-off to show it was fit to be a prison was the responsibility of a couple of doctors. The next year, 1829, the prison was deemed to be overcrowded, holding far too many prisoners above its authorised capacity. And it's been pretty much overcrowded ever since. Nearly 200 years of a Victorian prison overcrowded. Quite frightening, really. Let's talk about the original regime. Now, I've not been too kind speaking about the justice of the peace so far, but I want to actually pay credit to them. Um, their original thinking around the prison is they wanted it to be financially self-supporting. So they had to put a penny on the rates to pay for the prison to be built, and it was badged as the Essex County Jail. To an extent, it still is. But they didn't really want to have to dip into the public purse any more than was absolutely necessary. So they decided that they wanted the prison to be self-funding, self-financing. And in order to do that, they set up four workshops. They set up a miller's workshop. Following on from that was a bakery and a brewery, because the drinking water then was so foul that people would drink beer all day, even for breakfast. So having a brewery in, in a prison wasn't quite such a silly idea. And the fourth workshop was a shoemaker's and uh, shoe repairer's workshop. And that worked very well. It was extremely remunerative. Um, the baker's workshop in particular made far more bread than they needed to feed the prisoners, so they started to sell it on the streets of Chelmsford. But that was a real big problem for the justices. They wanted the prison to be self-financing, they'd show foresight uh, and good planning, and they recognised that if the prisoners were used to doing a good job of work, they'd gain work skills, so when they're released, they've got more chance of going straight. So everything about that decision was good, except they hadn't anticipated surplus bread going onto the local market and undercutting the existing Chelmsford bakers. Now that caused a problem for the justices in their other role as landowners, because they owned all the property, they were taking rents from their tenants, but the bakers couldn't pay their rents. They couldn't pay all their due to landed gentry because their market had collapsed, because the prison had captured it all. That was a real problem for the justices and they didn't know how to solve it. But there was a hero of the hour and um, an individual came along and talked it through and made a deal that he would take all the surplus bread made by the prison and transport it to London. London's population was growing hugely and significantly. So they were desperate to get fresh bread. So he took all the surplus, transported it to London, sold it for a good profit. The prison was happy, their money was covered, they'd made extra flogging it to London. The Chelmsford Bakers were happy because they regained their market. The justices were happy because as landlords they were getting paid. Win-win all round. What I find most interesting about the story is the family that were evicted from the prison 
who might have been all bitter and twisted and full of revenge, it was that family that brokered the deal to move all the surplus bread down to London. And guess what? That family name is Marriage. And that was the beginning of Marriage Mills, a 200 year old business known throughout the world, always been in family ownership, always been at Chelmsford. And had it not been for what happened at the prison, who knows, that may never have happened. Let's move on to what the prisoners did in their initial regime. So they had to mill the flour. So um, there was a device built, and the best way I can describe it is it's like a giant human hamster wheel, enormous, and had planks of wood on the outside. And men would stand in a straight line, and they'd stand on the plank of wood, and the wheel would go down. The next plank of wood would come in, like stairs, and they'd stand on that one. And that was what moved the millstone to make the flour. And they had to do that job six days a week, then had Sunday off, for nine and a half hours a day. Pretty brutal. Their rations for doing that was a pint of gruel. Gruel is best described as a cross between uh, a watery soup and a porridge. The other thing they had to eat was a four ounce um, block of oatmeal, which is like a, a big round hard biscuit. And that was all they had to exist on for nine and a half hours of, of forced labour. Their health deteriorated, a lot of prisoners were dropping down dead. The justices of the peace were so concerned, they ordered the governor to give them fruit because scurvy had set in. So they needed the fresh fruit to keep things ticking over. Okay. Now in my introduction, I told you about um, some of the people, um, quite famous people who'd spent time at Chelmsford Prison. And there's one who currently appears on the BBC prime time every weekend guaranteed, quite often appears on ITV and fairly often appears on Sky. You, you'll know him. Um, that person has also got a link to a world famous football team and that's Arsenal. I'm talking about Ian Wright. Ian Wright has scored more goals for Arsenal than any other British player. Uh, and he served time at Champs when he was 18 and he freely acknowledges that his spell in Champs of Prison was that clicking of the light switch that changed his behaviour, allowed him to focus on what he was doing and change his life around to become an international footballer, Arsenal's greatest goal scorer and now a prime time pundit that football fans will be used to seeing all the time. Closely allied to Ian Wright, um, it's September, the, the Chelmsford Heritage Festival is about to begin. What also happens in September? Fans of Strictly will know. The new star series of Strictly starts. Well, I can tell you now, one of the celebrities for the 2022 series of Strictly is a former graduate of Chelmsford Prison. He's also a famous footballer, also from Arsenal, Tony Adams. Football fans are all about Tony Adams. For those that aren't into football, but are into Strictly, keep an eye open. I'm not betraying any secrets about those two. They both spoke very positively about the time at Chelmsford. I've spoken to both of them and they're really nice guys. No axe to grind. Um, and I'm delighted they've gone on to do so well. Right, we're here outside Holy Trinity Church. Those people that come to the actual walking tour, you'll be astonished how close this church is to the prison. You'd never guess it from looking around this leafy, nice suburban scene. I brought you here because the influence of the church in development of Chelmsford prison specifically, but prisons generally, is huge and often misunderstood. And we talked about how Chelmsford under the, the foresight of the Justice of the Peace had a good regime, rehabilitating prisoners, making money, ticked all the boxes. But gradually, prison reformists and the Church of England, led by a um, whole series of bishops, put more and more pressure on the government, and all of those things were stopped. It was replaced by something called the silent and separate regime. And one of the leading proponents of that was a man called John Howard. People that follow stories about prison custody now 
Well, heard of the Howard League for Penal Reform. It's named after him. Now, they had some really strange ideas, and this is back in the mid-19th century. So rather than reform prisoners by giving them work, developing their skills, helping them to read and write, they were kept silent and separate. So they were kept in a cell on their own all day. Um, and the thinking was that the only two people that visited them, one was the turnkey, an early prison officer, to give them the food, and the chaplain. And the chaplain would come in and chat to them. They'd have a Bible, but no other books. And the thinking was that the prisoners would be so overcome with remorse for their crimes, they had so much time to reflect that they would find God and become miraculously rehabilitated overnight. Quite how they thought that would work with no work skills, no literacy skills, no family relationship skills, dealing with alcohol abuse, I, I don't know, but that's what happened. Um, so they were kept in their cell all day. The only time they were allowed out was to go to church. And it was silent and separate treatment. So they weren't allowed to speak to any other prisoners. So when they went out to the church, they had to wear a mask, a full frontal mask. When they went to exercise, they were all wrapped around the race with a big rope at six feet intervals. And they had to walk crocodile fashion and not talk to each other. And that discipline was enforced by other prisoners. I'm not sure that they did enforce it entirely. And when they went to church, the seats were very narrow wooden stalls. They had to stand up and it was no wider than your shoulders. And you couldn't see anybody either side. Silent and separate. Now it would be regarded as um, inhuman and, and torture. And their job was the most mindless and mundane. Um, after the baker's shop had closed down, they still kept on with the treadmill, but it wasn't attached to anything. So they saw the prisoners nine and a half hours on the treadmill, turning round, but it wasn't making anything. And the other job that prisoners had, if they locked in the cell all day, there was um, a big square wooden box. On the side of it was a handle. And inside the box was an axle, and the handle was a crank. And as you turn the handle, the axle rotated. And attached to that axle was two paddles about the size of my fist. And when the handle was turned, that just rotated inside the box. And what was put inside the box was sand and soil. And the deal was for the prisoners, in order to earn enough credit to have their tea that evening, they had to turn this crank 10,000 times. If they didn't turn it 10,000 times, wouldn't get any food. Um, but that's quite iconic in the history of the prison service because apart from a chaplain coming in, the turnkey would come in and the turnkey could adjust the pressure on the crank. So if he got on well with the prisoner and the prisoner was respectful, he could adjust the pressure so it was easier to turn the crank and he gets 10,000 revolutions done more quickly. If he was a bit stroppy and argumentative with the turnkey, he'd tighten the pressure so it'd be much more difficult to get in the revolutions. And all the turnkey did to adjust the pressure was turn a little screw. And that's the origin of the name used today for prison officers who are called screws. Now I want to talk about the role of prison governor. And it's fair to say the early prison governors were held almost in contempt by the justices. Um, there was a school of thought that thought prison governors were little more than criminals themselves. There was a, a famous article written in a London magazine in 1827 that described them as ruffians who think nothing but of enriching themselves through bribery and corruption. That was the underlying thinking. Um, in 1829, the, the Times newspaper published an article talking about a scandal involving a governor and a female prisoner. It didn't go into details. I don't think you need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that male governor, female prisoner, scandal, it was all about sex. And I'm sure that woman was with child, the governor did the evil deed, and, and that read, led to a real push for reformation of the office of prison governor. So the government led on this and they decided they wanted to have gentlemen governors. So where do you go to get a gentleman who needs to work to earn a living? You go to the military because the officers are referred to as officers and gentlemen. 
So a huge number of the prison governors from the 1830 onwards came with their Royal Navy rank or with their army rank. And that, to an extent, is still true today. That tradition has not died out completely. Um, the first gentleman governor of Chelmsford Prison was the second governor of the prison. He was appointed in 1860. as a guy called Henry McGorrigree. He was a captain in the Royal Artillery. And I'm going to focus on his story because I'm full of admiration for this guy. He, he's my hero of, of all prison governors. He was appointed to the job on a salary of £350 a year. In 1860, that was good money. As a condition of the job, he had to live in the prison, but a well-appointed um, three-storey building was provided in the prison. His wife and his children lived there with him. He had a couple of domestic servants, uh, and he also had a trap and a couple of ponies. So quite a comfortable economic situation and a much more respected role in society. The house is still in use now, it's used as offices, but you can still recognise it as a house. If you go into the office that was his living room, you see the old fireplace with the mantelpiece on top. Over the corridor you'll see what used to be a kitchen scullery. On the next floor you see what was children's bedrooms. Quite eerie. So things were going quite well. Um, Captain McGorrigree was pretty happy, but on the 2nd of August 1862 a tragedy occurred. The captain's son, William, aged seven, caught diphtheria in that house and he was ill for a few days and he died. Now that's a, that's a blow from which no parent can ever recover. It wasn't such a major surprise because if you go back in any family history, we will all find a family in Victorian times who had a child that died young. That's the way it went. But worse was to follow. 13 days later, on the 15th of August, 1862, Captain McGorrigy's daughter, Anne, she caught scarlet fever and she died. Two children in the space of 13 days in that house. And he's got to carry on living and working there, running the prison, be the man that's calm and collected. Uh, how he did it, I don't know. But the um, justices were not insensitive to the issue, so they temporarily moved the family out and they put some workmen in to do an 1860s version of fumigating. And they limestoned the walls, they cleaned it, everything cleaned to an inch of its life. So if there was any residual infection, they got rid of it. And the family moved back in in September. But on the 1st of October, 1862, Mary Ann, aged five, another daughter, she caught scarlet fever and she died. Three children dead in less than two months. Unbel unbelievable the pressure, the stress, how he managed to find the resilience to keep going, I don't know, but he kept going. And he was a well-respected governor who did a good job. The justices realized that there had to be something done about this. So they commissioned um, a doctor, a surgeon, to oversee what went wrong. And the doctor noted that diphtheria and scarlet fever were quite prevalent in Chelmsford at the time, but with good drainage and with good ventilation, people recovered. So as long as they followed those simple house rules, everything should be fine. The justices realised, well, we need a bit more than that. So they appointed a surveyor to come in and review that building, look at it in detail and come up with uh, a report that really went much deeper than the doctor could go with. And the surveyor's report was, was quite staggering and I'll illustrate, illustrate this by a bit of sign language now. So the house was a tower in the middle of the prison, four stories. Imagine I'm the tower and there's four prison wings. One was at that angle, one was at that angle, 
the other two were at that angle and they all filtered in to that tower. There was a couple of heavy steel gates that separated the governor and his family from all the prisoners. And the uh, surveyor had identified that all the drains from all the wings, all the prisoners' human waste, ran under the governor's house. But over the years, rats had gnawed it all away, and it was loose sewage that had been contaminating the whole area for years. The earth was impregnated with it, that filtered up to the walls, and that encouraged the conditions for those poor children who lost their lives. And they're all buried here. They're all buried in this churchyard, which is just next to the prison. So as well as doing his job as governor, he's got to look out and well, that's where, that's where the children are buried. Dreadful. So the surveyor recommended that the justices build a new house for the governor outside the prison grounds. That made perfect sense. The justices started out with a low estimation of them, then it went up, it's gone back down again now, because they hummed and hard, and they said, well, it's quite expensive. So they deferred a decision from October to the next quarter sessions in December. And then they talked about, could they fund the building of a house for the governor? And they decided to defer it. And they continued to defer it for 26 years. And the governor has got to carry on living and working in that house of horrors where his three children perished in the space of a few weeks and buried here. But the story doesn't end there. In 1868, just five years later, the governor's wife, Mary Ann, aged 47, she died in that house and was buried here with her children. How did the governor keep going? But that story's still not over because three years later, in 1871, another daughter, Florence, aged 10, she was ill and she died in that house. And she's buried here with her three siblings and her mother. Shameful. Captain McGorrigree carried on as governor. He carried on with a, a good reputation. He, he eventually retired and earned his pension he lived to the age of 80 at a time when adult life expectancy was mid-40s. Um, can anybody imagine that set of circumstances continuing and the resilience that he showed? And they're all still here. Some okay. Right, I, I promise you a story about an escape attempt. It wouldn't be a story about a prison if there wasn't an escape attempt. We're going to go back to 1837 um, and there's a group of prisoners who were all awaiting deportation to Australia and for many that was a fate worse than death. Um, just the journey out there, can you imagine it? Six months in a wooden boat with no stabilizers just being thrown all over the ocean. How you survived the journey I don't know and then when you got there you were in 40 degree heat with no facilities, no resources. Prisoners were desperate to do anything to avoid deportation to Australia. And one day in the church service, and the church service was in the same tower as the governor's house. It was right in the top of that tower. And there's a group of prisoners gone to church. Um, they didn't fancy going to Australia, so they made a breakout attempt. So they attacked and overpowered the prison officers on duty and took their keys. They then had to break out of the tower and had to break through the governor's house and out again into a courtyard. They were sensible enough not to go anywhere near the governor's family, they just went straight through. And then they found themselves in a courtyard and from the courtyard to the main gate is about 40 metres. And they were heading for that main gate. There was a huge kerfuffle and some of the prison officers on duty, not in the chapel, had heard what was going on. So they were protecting the main gate, determined to stop these people breaking out. And a pitch battle ensued. The prisoners heavily outnumbered the officers, but the officers had a couple of advantages. They were armed. They had one blunderbuss. A blunderbuss is a cross between a cannon and a shotgun. Quite a deadly machine. 
They all had swords. They all had pistols. I guess the pistols weren't a great deal of use because with the old flintlock, when you fired it once, you didn't have time to reload it. But they fought this pitch battle to hold these desperados at bay, and they would have done anything to escape deportation. And if it meant going to the gallows, they'd have preferred to do that. Eventually, the prison officers prevailed, and they forced the prisoners back. They were all tied up with rope and shoved in isolation. But I think the best part of the story, this is 1837. There wasn't social media, there wasn't the communication mechanisms we had now, but word got out of the prison very quickly to the citizens of Chelmsford. And within a matter of minutes, 500 men of Chelmsford, living and working in the local area, had formed a human barrier around the whole circumference of the prison. And they'd armed themselves with whatever they could get a hoe, a rake, a shovel, a pickaxe. If they had a sword, that was even better. And this determined ring of Chelmsford citizens who were not going to get those prisoners get past them into their town and threaten their livelihoods, their families, their business. They were determined to hold them at bay in the event it wasn't needed. And I often think, I wonder if that would happen now. I think we all know the answer. To that one. Okay, I, I promised to talk about executions. Gory subject, but it's part of the history. So the first execution at the prison was in 1829, and the last one was in 1914. So that's roughly 90 years, and there were 45 executions at the prison. So roughly one every two years. The first executioner was a man called William Calcroft. Now, he was the executioner for Newgate Prison. That was the big London prison. When it was knocked down, they built the Old Bailey on the site of it. Um, but he used to be subcontracted to Chelmsford, and he got paid a guinea for each execution. Calcroft's particularly interesting because he was longest serving high executioner of anybody in the country's history. 45 years as an executioner. But even more interesting, I think you'll agree, he was from Little Baddow in Chelmsford. So who knew the longest serving executioner is a Chelmsford man. The executions were public and it's hard to envisage now, but they were a big event. It was a bit like a carnival, and loads of people would come to see public executions. They all took place at eight o'clock in the morning, they'd get up early, and it was kind of a family fun day out. Unbelievable, absolutely incredible, but there we are. Now we know quite a lot about one particular execution on the 25th of March, 1851. We know a lot about that one because the Times sent a reporter to cover it in full, and he did a detailed story. What was so exciting about that execution? Firstly, it was a double execution. So that always got the blood boiling amongst the bloodthirsty crowd. Even better for spectacle, one was a woman and one was a man. And they were going to be executed on the gallows that are erected above the main gate so if you stand in front of the old court theatre on Springfield Road now, with the theatre behind you, look straight ahead, you'll be looking at the public gallows on top of that wall. So, Sarah Chesham, a woman, she's 42 years of age, and her story is like many. It started off as a bit of a domestic abuse issue. She had an argument with her husband. She wanted to make it up to him. So she decided to prepare him a really nice dinner when he got home from work. She'd really push the boat out, spend a bit more of the housekeeping. And the piece de resistance was the dessert, which is a big rice pudding. And it was a caramelised skin on the top. Oh, fabulous. I get my mouth water just thinking about it. And she put a special extra ingredient in the rice pudding. My husband ate it, complimented on it, but fairly soon started to feel ill, and he was at death's door. He eventually recovered, and the doctors investigated, and the special ingredient she put in the rice pudding 
was arsenic. So she used to be executed for attempted murder. Now there is a school of thought that would say that was a bit of an act of revenge by the authorities because Sarah Chesham had been suspected of poisoning her three former husbands who all died prematurely. They couldn't get her for those so they decided to get her for this attempted one. She probably did but that's by the by. So she was for the drop. The other person for the drop was a man called Thomas Drury. He was 23 and again it's a domestic incident. These things can escalate very quickly. Thomas was a workman who'd moved from Suffolk for work in Chelmsford. He'd got lodgings, he'd got a girlfriend. His girlfriend trotted round to Thomas's landlady's house one night, it was an autumn night, knocked on the door. The landlady sent Thomas to talk to her and she wanted to tell Thomas that she's pregnant. She was reasonably happy about it because she thought Thomas, he was a nice guy, he'd do the honourable thing, he would marry her and she would be free from a life of domestic toil. However, Thomas took a different point of view and he strangled her. So here's the drop as well. And the Times reporter describes the scene very well. So imagine Springfield Road and he estimated there was between seven and nine thousand people jammed into that tiny little area outside Old Court Theatre, down as far as the original wall of the prison. Seven to nine thousand jammed in, all itching to get a view of this public execution. But it was an atmosphere of gaiety and jollity in some respects, so people saw an opportunity to earn money. Firstly the food vendors, so pies were definitely flavour of the day. Lots of pie sellers selling an early pie breakfast. The pubs opened and they were selling uh, booze in little jugs that were passed around discreetly. There weren't many people had access to newspapers, so aspiring writers had written the story of these two murders and these two people on a sheet and they sold this for a penny a sheet to the crowd. I'm sure they invented some of the stories to make it salacious. Is that any different to the tabloid press now? Probably not. Um, there were musicians playing. There were evangelists who were there preaching the almighty God and this is a sin against God to execute people. Or some evangelists saying, yeah, execute them. They don't deserve to live. But what the journalist noted most of all was that a number of older ladies, dowager ladies, so older than was in the 40s, because that was old then, um, and they, this group of dowager ladies were directing all the young women that were part of their family. So young, young women, sort of 17 to about 21, whilst they're waiting for a husband, were supervised by these dowager ladies. And these dowagers were showing the young ladies where to get the best possible view, where to get closest to the action, where to see the face of the executioner, where to see the face of the accused. And it was really bloodthirsty. And I just think, times have changed. But that's how it was, and that was a big day, a big fun day in the life of Chelmsford. Now, talking of executions, if I were to ask you to name a family of executioners, I guess many of you would come up with the name Pierpoint. The most famous one is Albert Pierpoint, and he's executed more people than anyone else in history. William Coolcraft from Chelmsford was the hangman for the longest, but Albert Pierpoint executed more because after the Second World War he had the contract to execute all the Nazi war criminals on behalf of all the Allied forces. And he's the only hangman you can see on YouTube. He did an interview in his 70s with Michael Parkinson. What's not so well known is the other two peer points. His father, Henry, he was the first peer point to become an executioner. And he was arbitrarily, his last execution took place in 1910, and he, he was just not given any more executions. And he went to his grave protesting, he didn't know why. And Albert was, went to his grave protesting, he didn't know why his dad had been treated so badly. We found out why in 2010. So 
The events occurred in 1910 and government papers are released under the 100-year rule. 100 years after the events I'm about to describe, that became public knowledge and it became quite obvious why Henry Pierpoint was sacked. So it was an execution at Chelmsford Prison. Now the way it worked, there's always two executioners, the main man and his assistant. There's always an assistant, one in case the main man got ill, so the assistant could step in, but two, they worked together to set up the equipment, to test the equipment, to calculate the length of the drop, which is really important. And they had to come along um, the day before the execution and stay overnight in the prison and do the deed the next morning. Henry Pierpoint turned up about four o'clock in the afternoon. He'd had a few beers, there's no doubt about that. And he saw his assistant, John Ellis, waiting for him. And Henry Pierpoint just launched a murderous attack at John Ellis. And he was battering seven bells out of him. And he's calling him all sorts. And the final insult was <laughs> Prison officers interceded, they kept them apart. Pierpoint sobered up. The next day, the execution went without a hitch. But the governor and the high sheriff had to make a report to the government clearly. And the Home Secretary of the day wrote on that report, make sure this man is never employed again. And that wasn't revealed until 2010. How Henry Pierpoint could complain he didn't know, that's beyond me. But his downfall, the beginning of the downfall of the Pierpoints from Chelmsford Prison. Another interesting fact, the Home Secretary wrote on that piece of paper was none other than Winston Churchill. Now, to finish off um, the, the executions, all the prisoners were buried on prison grounds. And there's a very narrow strip of land opposite the park, opposite Lionmead Park, um, on the far side of Sandford Road. Very narrow, and the prisoners were buried there. But they were buried in an unusual way. They weren't buried horizontally, they were buried vertically. Now, that wasn't some sort of weird revenge to condemn them to eternal damnation. It was pragmatic. The ground to bury them was so small, they didn't have room to bury them horizontally. They had to bury them vertically. They were all exhumed in 1952, and exhumed is probably a bit too uh, sophisticated a word. So a prison officer with a wheelbarrow, a couple of wheelbarrows, some digging implements, and half a dozen prisoners dug up the bodies. And then they were transported to be reinterred elsewhere and the prison officer when he was interviewed many years later i was the governor he'd say to the prisoner and he worked his all the way up to the governor he said they couldn't be entirely sure that the right uh, hip bone had gone with the right skull or gone with the right arm uh, those were desperate times i told you earlier about the governor and the house of horrors where he and his family were required to live Look at this. That's the White House. It's now apartments. That's where the chaplain lived. So the governor, 26 years until they give him a decent house when his family have withered and died. And the chaplain is living in the lap of luxury in an enormous mansion. Well, you saw the house where the chaplain lived, that big, fabulous white mansion. And we said the governor is stuck there in that chamber of horrors watching his family drop dead. And it kind of illustrates the disproportionate relationship between the governor and the powers that be and the chaplain and the powers that be. In law, only three posts have to exi exist in a prison. One's the governor, one's the doctor, and one's the chaplain. And back then, the bishop always appointed the chaplain. The governor had no say in it. The bishop made the appointment and they had more power than the governor under silent and separate treatment, more influence for the rehabilitation, um, more connections with the landed gentry who were the justices of the peace. And yeah, I don't hold many of the chaplains in particularly high regard, but there is one that I hold in the highest, highest regard. I'm going to tell you about him. So, Towns of Prison had two major fires. First one was 1878. 
Now, a fire in a prison is the worst scenario. You've got all these people locked up in a confined space. 1878, there wasn't a fire brigade, there wasn't a 999 service. Fire broke out, and the prisoners that were locked in their cells could smell the burning. They could feel the heat slowly coming towards them. The smoke was drifting in through the door. And there were just a few officers on duty and a few trusted prisoners that had unlocked to fight the fire. And the rest of the prisoners were going berserk. They were locked in this cell, which they thought was going to be their tomb. And they were trying everything they could, every conceivable means of breaking out, going to safety. And the noise, the smell, the aggression, the threat, you, you can imagine it's literally like Dante's Inferno. Now the chaplain was sitting nice and comfortable in his big white mansion there. But actually he realised, no, I need to do some work here. So he left his comfortable, lovely white mansion and he went into the prison and he walked into the part of the prison that was burning. And he went round the cells of all the prisoners. And this chaplain was very well respected, held in high regard by staff and prisoners. And he reassured the prisoners, you're not going to die. We're not going to abandon you. If it gets that bad, we'll unlock you. I, I will make sure you get safe conduct. You've got to commit to me not to do anything stupid. And the whole situation was calmed down very quickly. Um, and he was the hero of the hour, no doubt about that. The fire was extinguished. Chaplin went back. Now fast forward to the year 2007 and um, a letter arrived at the prison from a lady who was researching her family history and she discovered that her great-grandfather was the chaplain at Chelmsford Prison in 1878 and she wondered if she could come and have a look round. Now I had an officer there that was um, he's very keen on prison history. He was, he was Chelmsford born and bred, worked at the prison all his life, very good amateur historian, and he was quite keen to come in on his day off and help this lady and facilitate a visit. I was okay with that. What she didn't know was the details of the fire and how her great grandfather had been the hero of the hour, saved the prison without question, and. You can imagine she was delighted to hear that story, delighted to know he was held in such high regard. The day went very well. The lady posed with staff and prisoners for photographs. It was a delight. And that's because the lady was Joanna Lumley. And the chaplain, her great-grandfather, was the Reverend Charles Lumley. Now, we know Joanna is a fabulous actress, um, but she didn't become a natural, a national treasure just because of her acting. Many of you will know she did that because of the work she did on behalf of the Gurkhas. Now the Gurkhas are fierce warriors from the mountains of Nepal who have a long history of serving the British Army. And they serve the 22 years. They are formidable fighting men, incredibly loyal and a real asset to the army. And Joanna discovered that after their 22 year service, they were given a pension, which was about a third of the pension that a British soldier would get. But they were sent back to Nepal. They weren't allowed to stay in this country. So how ridiculous is that? They've, they've served this country. They've fought for this country. They put their life on the line for 22 years. And at the end of it all, we say, you've got to go now, you can't stay here. It's appalling. And Joanna picked up on that and she was a real advocate to correct the wrong done to the Gurkhas. And she was successful, it took her a few years, and that was one of the reasons why she got Damehood and why she's become a national treasure. But the story is much deeper in Chelmsford than you might imagine because the Reverend Lumley, the brave chaplain. He had quite a few children. One of them was, well, most of them were born in the White House. The one I'm talking about was born in the White House here at Sanford Road in Chelmsford. When he grew up, he joined the army and he became a Gurkha officer. And he had a great career. And he also had a son who followed in his father's footsteps. And that was Joanna's father. 
and Joanna grew up as the child of a Gurkha army family. So that national treasure status, that correcting the wrong done to a real group of brave fighting men who deserve their place in the history of the country is directly traced back to events in the White House, Sanford Road in Chelmsford. I said there was two fires. The other one was exactly 100 years later, 1978, and that was formidable. There was so much of the prison damage, all the prisoners were moved out for the prisons, and most of the staff were moved out. And the Home Office was thinking long and hard, shall we just bin it, you know, is this repairable? Is it going to be cost effective? Whilst the Home Office was humming and hawing, there was a film company that was making a feature film, and it was set in a prison. And to build a set would be quite a big job. So they took a cheeky punt, not expecting to get any good answers, on asking if they'd make the film at Chelmsford Prison. And that, to delight and surprise, the Home Office said, yes, and that film is Porridge. And there's lots of library pictures of Ronnie Barker in character as Fletcher with the real-life Chelmsford prison officers and Mr Mackay with the real-life Chelmsford prison officers. I saw the film a few months ago, about Easter time, and uh, it's nearly all set in the prison outside on the football pitch, which is still the football pitch. That hasn't changed. And you can clearly see the White House rising above the prison fence, and that's a nice reminder and a reassurance that it is Chelmsford Prison and the White House is still there. The White House is now luxury flats, very nice indeed. I went round pretending I wanted to buy one, I was just being nosy really. So that's some parts of Chelmsford's history over 200 years, Chelmsford Prison history over 200 years, condensed, there's lots more stuff. The biggest challenge I had was deciding what to leave out. People often say to me, well, will it be here in 200 years' time? No, it won't. That building is really falling apart. I think its days are numbered, but it will live in the history of Chelmsford for many of the reasons that we've said. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Mm -hmm.